Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. So, in part A of this video, of, of this two, two video series, I talked about the highlights of this um, study that has shown that the, the study is called Permafrost Nitrous Oxide Emissions Observed on a Landscape Scale Using the Airborne Eddy Covariance Method. So, in a nutshell, there's a lot of variability, but nitrous oxide, N2O, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas with a global warming potential of 300 times that of CO2 on a 100 year time scale. So that's at least 10 times that basically of uh, methane, 300 times that of CO2, is coming out from the thawing permafrost up in the Arctic at levels that are at least a dozen times higher than we expected in the past. Okay, we know nitrous oxide is produced in tropical regions. We didn't expect it to be coming up uh, out of the thawing permafrost. Okay, so this is a hugely significant paper, and I'm going to discuss the details and figures of the paper and talk about a little bit about infrared spectroscopy and how, how we're measuring this you know, how we're measuring uh, other greenhouse gases on the ground in the Arctic. So this is a paper. I highly recommend that you dig it up and have a look at it. Um, this is my blog, paulbeckwith.net, just giving a plug uh, to make sure that you, uh, you know, you have a look at this. And, uh, you know, I've, I've done hundreds, of hundreds and hundreds of videos, and uh, I talk all about the joining the dots on abrupt climate change, the climate system. So this is a, an article that was recently on um, Facebook, okay? And also I tweeted it out recently. Emissions from thawing Arctic permafrost may be 12 times higher than thought, scientists say. So this, is, this just came out. Um, this article here, I'll talk about it. Here's the article, I'll show you some details. This needs to be taken more seriously than it is right now. Basically, we haven't been measuring nitrous oxide in the Arctic. Here you can see melting permafrost in Alaska. It's on the northern slope, which slopes down into the Arctic Ocean. Basically, you can see all of these lakes forming and these features called thermokarst features. When the permafrost thaws, it slumps, fills with water. And uh, anyway, this is a region Permafrost is basically soil, rock, or sediment that's been frozen for at least two years, mostly found in the uppermost areas where temperatures are rising more quickly than the rest of the world. Okay, um, when it thaws because of warming, it releases large quantities of carbon dioxide and methane, right? But also non-carbon greenhouse gases, N2O, nitrous oxide, is uh, much more potent than CO2, stays in the atmosphere for an average of 114 years. It's been assumed that there's been minimal emissions in permafrost, but not according to this new study. Okay, so small plane with a probe in the nose measured the greenhouse gases. Um, they found that the nitrous oxide was much, much higher. In just one month in August, Basically, what came out was what we thought would come out in an entire year. Now, this is also a problem because nitrous oxide rises up in the stratosphere. It's broken down, it's photolyzed, broken down by active oxygen, converted into nitro nitrogen oxides, NOx, NO2, NO3, etc., which destroys, breaks down the ozone. So this is, this is a problem. Okay, so let's look at the... Uh, paper here. So this is a paper, but before I talk about the details in the paper, I want to talk a little bit about infrared absorption. So basically, this is a CO2 molecule, carbon, two oxygens. The bonds here change in length. The thing can stretch, okay? So when you have incoming infrared, it can excite the molecule. These are the excitation stages of the mic molecule. You can have symmetric stretching. Both of this atom moves away from the center, the, this is this oxygen moves away from the carbon. Okay, you can have asymmetric stretching. One oxygen moves away, the other one doesn't. Um, you can have bending or twisting. You can have wagging. So these different modes of vibration they absorb infrared as infrared energy hits the CO2 molecule. The molecule goes to an excited state. Physically, 
it can stretch or vibrate or bend and that uh, takes up the energy that traps the heat the the energy is encapsulated the infra the electromagnetic radiation light is absorbed in the molecule makes the molecule go to a higher energy state okay so this happens this is an example of the co2 so the bond stretching shown here okay uh, this molecule is moving further away this one's moving closer it gives you an, an absorption line so if this is the electromagnetic radiation there's an absorption line based on the strength of this absorption line you can figure out how much of the molecule you have or this is the bond breaking this the um, carbon moves up two oxygens move down so the whole thing bends there's an absorption line here okay so this is the infrared signature if you like for water we have a similar thing here let's see if we can get this working I don't see water coming up why not where is my uh... okay it worked for me before you can click on these links and you can bit basically the same thing you can see the water molecule the molecules how the bending and breaking and stretching etc twisting can create absorption lines and give you an infrared emission spectra so let's have a look here so how do we measure it well we can have a cell here with the gas inside here and we have light coming in light can bounce off these mirrors back and forth and we can have we can detect how much of the molecule is in there based on the strength of the absorption so what we do is a very clever thing where we have this coming in slightly off axis and it bounces back and forth in this cavity so actually the experiment that i'm talking about in the paper they had a 25 centimeter distance between the two high reflectivity mirrors like a laser cavity the light bounced back and forth 2,500 times, giving you a 625 meter effective path length, allowing you to detect very, very low concentrations of the gas that you were trying to detect. Okay, so that's basically spectroscopy based on the infrared absorption of these molecules. You can detect concentrations. Okay, that's the gist of it. Okay, so let's go into the paper here and let's look at the figures. Okay, I've talked about a lot of the details. Like I said, N2O is the third most influential anthropogenic greenhouse gas and so on. But I want to show you the results first. Okay, so this is a cool, very, very cool plane. It's called the Diamond DA42. It was flying about 15 meters above the surface over the Arctic North Slope. And there's the device here on the front called the bat probe okay and it was crisscrossing the north slope so here's one set of flights here the white lines and then it had this is another set of flights here another set of flights here another one here okay so these are tracks and like I said this data was collected in August 2013 from from this aircraft using a probe and basically the air was captured in this probe it was sent through this there's a laser here shining light through this cell and based on the absorption lines corresponding to nitrous nitrous oxide n2o you could measure the concentration of the n2o then you vented out the gas because you're continuously collecting more and more air analyzing it venting out the gas okay so that's that's basically the gist of the experiment and let's have a look at the results okay well this is the this these were the different flights okay and there's different terrain underneath so sedge are like different types of um, grasses okay so the different open water different what the plane flew over it classified the ground structure underneath the plane so a lot of open water on this flight sedges etc and basically tussock tundra high emissions of N2O, for example. Anywhere where there were um, slumps and things, these thermokarsh lakes, very, very high emissions, as long as there wasn't too much water. So this is the infrared spectrum. So I showed you an example of it. So the different, these different absorption lines correspond to different molecules and different, different um, patterns of vibration, twisting, etc. So methane is here here these are all methane lines here this is um, water vapor these three lines 
here, here, and here, and this one is nitrous oxide. So by, based on the strength of the absorption, you could, and you know the path length of the cell, right, that the light's bending through, you get an absorption, and you can figure out how much nitrous oxide, the concentration of nitrous oxide, and you get, you continuously collect this data as you're flying along, and you can get the nitrous oxide concentration, because this line will move up and down depending on the amount of nitrous oxide detected by this bat probe. So this, is, uh, this shows you the lasers here, the beam is split into two pathways. One comes through here, it goes through a something called a germanium etalon, and as the laser is scanned in frequency, you get, this, you get these fringes and you can calculate the um, frequencies and so on. And then here's the part that goes through the detection cell 2,500 times. So it's 25 centimeter long detection cell, but the path lengths of the light, so the light comes through, bounces back and forth between these mirrors 2,500 times, some of it comes out, and it's got a 625 meter effective path length, so you can accurately measure the amount of N2O. And then you suck the N2O out of the cell on a continuous basis because you're flying along and it's continuously being filled up. So what's the data show? Okay, you do some manipulation, manipulation, you do some analysis, some, some physics, some, you know, in your spectroscopy, and you get some data like this, and then if you normalize it, what you can find is that uh, this is the, you're measuring H2O, water vapor flux, the levels of water vapor in the detector. You're measuring the nitrous oxide is the red line, you're measuring the methane. So previously, when the data was collected, water vapor and methane were looked at, nitrous oxide, not really so much. Right, we didn't think it would change, but here obviously it does change a lot. Okay, so these this is the flight 28.10. So let's go back to the top here. So flight 28.10 is the yellow line. So boop, 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 boop. Okay, so the plane went, you know, back and forth. Presumably it didn't go around and start here. It probably went here, 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 here. Okay, so that's the flight over the Arctic um, North Slope, and this is the data. So very low levels of N2O are the blues. As you go to red and black, you get higher and higher. So hot spot here, hot spot here, hot spot here. So there's a lot of variability along the flight path, and this could be correlated depending on what you were flying over, and you could say, okay, um, certain areas are high levels of N2O, other areas are low levels. Whereas before, you know, with the sampling, we might just look at this region and say, hey, N2O is really low, right? But it's not, okay? There's a high variability, okay? So this is the key data. And uh, yeah, so that's basically the gist of the experiment, okay? So, so what you could see is, so this is, a, this is a, the longitude here. These are the latitude lines, degrees north. Okay, and you could actually, so what you can do, going back to this up here, is you can figure out how much, you know, okay, N2O is spiking here, what's on the ground underneath? N2O is spiking here, what's on the ground underneath? And so on. Do that for each of this data, analyze the data, and basically over peat, N2O levels were much higher over thermal karst, karst slumps where the permafrost is thawed and slumped down, um, you know, again, high levels. Remember, there's a lot of nitrogen in the top three meters. So basically the problem is, I don't know if you've seen this paper where, you know, Banks Island, it was looking at the, these features. It used Google Earth um, data to look at the um, thermal karst lakes and slumps, retrogressive slumps and it found that there's been huge increases in the slumping. You know, as the permafrost is thawing, you know, there's a lot of collapses of the ground in regions, and that's clearly releasing high amounts of N2O. So this is a huge non-carbon feedback that we really didn't expect. We really didn't think this was, um, you know, the Arctic would be, there was enough microbial activity in the Arctic to release lots of N2O. But wrong again, right? Wrong again. This is a huge feedback, which is greatly warming the Arctic. Anyway, thanks for listening.